Hope and Patience with Amelia Rope, a podcast about business, well-being and chocolate. Hello to my lovely listeners. A quick question. Have you or your family ever gone hungry? And when I say hungry, I mean seriously hungry. I remember lean days in my chocolate business where I lived off bean sprouts, tomato ketchup and parsley. But actually, if I really, really needed food, I could get it. It's unnerving to think that we live in one of the wealthiest cities and yet we have a growing issue with people not able to buy food to feed themselves and their families, made even worse by COVID-19. Our guest today is a lady who founded a charity in 2014, which has had and continues to have massive impact on hunger and food waste. The charity distributes donated fresh and usable surplus food to food banks, charities, community groups and more. A whopping 170,000 meals are rescued and distributed each week. It's more than just food. It has a huge social aspect too, helping choirs for the homeless, after-school adventure playgrounds, groups trying to help teens stay out of gangs, secure shelters for trafficked women. So our guest today is the changemaker, Laura Winningham, who is founder of the charity City Harvest. A huge hello to Laura. Hi, thanks so much for having me today. It's such a pleasure. So Laura, I would love to ask you the why. What was the catalyst to setting up City Harvest and what were you doing before which led you to this? Well, I was one of the co-founders of City Harvest. It was a group of us who realized that in London, one of the wealthiest cities in the world, there were so many tons of food going to waste each day and at the same time so many people facing hunger. We started quite small, but just decided to try to connect waste and want and make a difference. Before this, I wasn't in the world of food. I had worked on Wall Street as a financial analyst and portfolio manager, just decided to make a change. Quite some change. I mean, was there anything like that going on in London or the UK at that time? There was really no one focused on what we call the last mile in food redistribution, which is food that is still perfectly good, but had a short life. So food that supermarkets couldn't sell at the end of the day and food that needed to be redistributed quickly, restaurant surplus, no one was in that space. And we knew that there were other organizations around the world in New York, Toronto, Sydney, and many other places that were already doing this. And we saw that there was a big gap in London. And where do you originate from, Laura? From New York. Ah, lucky you, the other side of the pond. Have you ever experienced going without food or had any of the co-founders alongside you had that experience? Yes. One of the co-founders was someone who had been someone who sought food at one of the charities that we delivered to, and he had been homeless for a while. You know, we found a borrowed van and he was the one driving it at the beginning. We were sourcing food from Whole Foods Kensington and delivering it to a church called The Upper Room. Many of the people that are employed by City Harvest now have experience with hunger or homelessness. So it's a really big part of our ethos. I mean, that's incredible. So for me, coming from the chocolate world, my big thing is that the logistics of this business must be a supply chain nightmare because you don't necessarily know what you're getting or when you're getting it. And presumably, I don't know how many organizations you've got waiting for food, but presumably they're quite a lot. Is that something that is a strong part of your personality, the sort of logistical, practical side of things? How do you work the logistics? The logistics are extremely complex. Most people that come from the food industry, when they visit us for a day, just cannot believe that we're doing what we do. We don't know what food we're getting in each day. The 300 charities to which we deliver each have different needs, different dietary requirements. They're open different times of day in short slots. It's complex. We started small and we grew organically. Somehow it's worked. Since the COVID crisis started three months ago, we doubled in size. And did you double in size with manpower and donations or was it the need that was outstripping the sort of supply? It was the need driving it. So uh, it was with reduced manpower that we doubled in size. So our team has been heroic. They've worked round the clock. Plus, we've had many volunteers from the food sector come in. So when 
the restaurants and hospitality industry were closing down. So many companies that didn't know about us before found us because they didn't want to waste food. So in a couple of days, we received 120 tons of food from restaurants and hospitality um, companies. And we figured out a way to get that into the community where need was doubling and sometimes tripling at the community organizations that we deliver to. Wow. And do you have a limit on how many community organizations you can support? Even before the COVID crisis, we had a wait list of 190 organizations that wanted our food. Some are registered charities, some are just community organizations. It really is any group that can use our food for the greater good. There was a big demand for that already. The level of food poverty in London is quite high. Now it's much greater, but there's a limit. So we're limited by our supply and financial donations, which keep our vans on the road. So we have a fleet of refrigerated vans. We have paid drivers. That's our limitation. How many do you have in your team, Laura? There's around 25 people on the City Harvest team. We have a fleet of 14 vans. Each of those vans has a driver. The drivers have dedicated routes such that each day of the week they get to know the community organizations to which they're delivering really well. Because we don't know what food we're getting, the drivers need to know what types of food those groups need. It's not like Okada where groups can order specific food from us, but our drivers know what they need. So children's programs might need healthy snacks and fruit and veg. We have halal organizations, vegetarian meals. So it's there's a lot of knowledge. To work out who has what food and to support all the sort of different cultures, I would imagine is, is really complex. So the drivers sound as if they're really key in the project. They are absolutely key. We, we could not do it without our drivers and they are very passionate about the work they do and they become really involved in the programs that they stop by and deliver food to. So they're really committed to them. If they see certain food come into the depot that they think would be appropriate for the organizations on their routes, they put it aside and make sure they get it on their vans and get it out. Laura, what's been the most memorable challenge since you've been running City Harvest? And what was the sort of learning from that challenge? We've had a very can-do attitude since we started. Even when we were very tiny, you know, if a large food donor came to us and said they have a donation, we always say yes. So the challenges have always been rising to the occasion and we've done that. You know, if overnight we had to double in size just like we did in the last three months, we never turn down food because we know that the need is out there in the community. So we've had a few occasions where we were able to get very large volumes out. And you were actively involved very quickly with Grenfell. Yeah, absolutely. So we again, we were still a young organization then um, we had just moved into our first depot because originally we were just operating with some vans, picking up food and dropping it off, and then, you know, there was no depot to go to. We just moved into our depot when the Grenfell incident happened and were relatively near to that location. So we sent our vans out that morning filled with anything um, breakfast-related. You know, we had milk and cereal and various things. City Harvest operates across London. We know each local community very well. We knew the churches and other community halls that would be the ones closest to Grenfell in which they might set up a table for food for anyone that's been displaced. Our van was able to get through the police lines and get the food in. So, you know, it was a very emotional experience because our team was out there standing on the sites where survivors were standing. So uh, mm. to this day, it's a very emotional time. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, huge. So. It sounds as if you have things like milk in the fridge. I mean, do you have huge, great refrigeration and you always have the sort of basic supplies like milk and cereal and things like that? Uh, we don't always. Um, we, we have walk-in chiller units and freezer units. We don't have great inventory. What comes in goes out almost immediately. So if I look in those units on you know, Monday, by Tuesday, it will be 100%. I think we were lucky that day that we had milk. That's not always the case. But we have general things from different food groups. A one blessing of the most horrendous yeah. time. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we can accept every type of food. So chances are that we have some dairy and some meat and fruit and veg. Do you ever worry that this food supply is going to stop and that you're going to turn up and there isn't going to be enough to feed 
your organizations? What we do is we promise our organizations we're coming on specific days of the week. So usually most of our partners get deliveries once a week. On days where donations are short, what we try and do is have ambient food in the depot. So that's more like food bank food. That's not our specialty. So that's tins and bags of rice and cereal. But uh, on days when we're not getting fresh produce and fresh ingredients, we'll go into that bit and just deliver something. City Harvest is very different than food banks because we have this focus on fresh, perishable, really healthy ingredients, not just emergency rations. We're, we're delivering things that people can cook into excellent, nutritious meals. I bet you guys could create an incredible cookbook. Absolutely. Cooks and the chefs at our partner programs are so creative. They can take whatever we give them. And we, we do deliver really great high quality ingredients, but they're the ones that are creative. A lot of them send us photos on a regular basis about what they've prepared. And it's really astounding. So Laura, a bit about you and your sort of mindset and what sort of makes you tick. How do you maintain your focus and your clear thinking when there is so much going on? It's quite challenging. Every single day, there's so much going on. Every single day is different and unpredictable. There are certain days when a company will go into administration and donate all their food. We also get food from movie sets. Something will go wrong in a movie set and tons of food will be delivered to us because the set has shut down. So we're ready for anything. It is very hard to stay focused. We have a team that has this particular skill set. One wouldn't be able to work at City Harvest unless they were able to deal with a lot going on, a lot of change. Someone that wants things just so without too much chaos would find it a very challenging work environment. So we're able to focus because the team has expertise in doing that. It's easy to get overwhelmed by you know everything we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So, Laura, um, one of the things that I ask my guests is about their inner critic, because I feel that most of us have it, and sometimes it's quite difficult to keep it at bay. Do you have an inner critic, and how do you balance it out? Well, that's a good question. I definitely have an inner critic. Sometimes I have to stop and look at what's been achieved by our team in the last five, six years days where that inner critic is rather loud and just say that, you know, millions of meals have gotten out into the community. And even if it had been just one meal, that would have been great. So sometimes we don't always get it perfectly, but we're still making a difference. What bolsters your resilience? What keeps you going with it all? Again, along the same lines, just seeing the impact each day. So it, obviously it's extremely hard work each day is very challenging but sometimes we'll get a call from a community partner thanking us for the delivery that day telling us what they did with the food telling us that children had a great meal and then it's you know words of appreciation and thanks that make all the difference and keep us going and it's a reminder that while we're focused on the logistics the food is getting where it's going and really making a big impact so with your decision making Laura when you have to make the decisions i'd imagine that you also make them as a group but as you as an individual, are you someone who makes snap decisions very quickly and they're effective? Are you someone who likes to take your time on decisions? I tend to make decisions quickly, but I'm also very data driven. If something could be analyzed clearly with numbers, I will be the ones crunching the numbers and coming to a decision that way. But many other times I make a snap decision and it, it's um, based on input I've had, but I think that the work we do, um, it's very quick moving. There have to be quick decisions. So I've gotten quite good at that over the last few years. What skill set, if they were going to set up a charity like yours, potentially outside London, because I don't, don't think you cover other areas, what sort of skill set do they need to be able to be effective with it, would you say? To be effective, I think one has to be really relentless. It can be done, and I know it needs to be done in other cities, and I'd be more than happy to um, share with others how we did it, but it's really just um, not giving up, being resilient, being committed, and working hard. Um, I'm very project-oriented. I was able to see the end goal that all the unused food in London needed to get out to all the people that were not getting meals, so that's a pretty big end goal. So the you know, few times there have been roadblocks, I was able to keep my eye on that vision um, and just not give up. 
how do you juggle in your mind with the uncertainty, the uncertainty with funding, the uncertainty with the food donations? You know, oftentimes potential financial donors want to understand, you know, our five-year strategic plan, but there's always a lot of variables in that. Just as you pointed out, there's question about the food supply and many other things. Again, it's being resilient because there have been times where, you know, we've been concerned about the food supply, um, but we just kept pushing through it and trying to spread awareness to get more food. And so we've just pushed through it in times where we really have to focus on fundraising. It is a daunting challenge because the work we do does involve a lot of funding. We have a fleet of vans. It's expensive to keep these vans on the road, even though the retail value of the food that each van delivers for free is so huge. We make a very high impact for the amount of funds that we expend we still have to raise those funds. Again, that's back to just being relentless because there's so many moving parts, it's easy to get daunted. So it, you know, it takes someone that just won't give up. You can't be daunted by all these question marks that are up in the air each day. No, too many. I mean, do you compartmentalize it then and just think, okay, that, that funding issue is going to be parked up and I'm going to focus on something else? I'm working on all of them concurrently. Each day, I really, like, I, I, don't really separate out. I'm doing all of them all the time in the same, you know, if one minute I'm dealing with a food related email, one minute later, I'm dealing with a fundraising related call. So it's all of the above all day. So it, it's it's more multitasking than compartmentalizing. Do you think your um, past in the finance world has really helped you? Absolutely, because I, I really do a lot of data analysis. We track all the food that comes in and goes out, volumes, types of food, trends, and because I was a financial analyst in the past, I really dig deep into the data. A random question, but what is the most popular donated food? Well, I think there is a lot of bread to be donated, but we, we do have to turn down bread because we like to fill our vans with more nutritious food than that. So um, that would be the case if we accepted it. 35% of the food we distribute is fruit and veg. And that is um, really welcome. A lot of the people that go to organizations to eat the food that we deliver, they don't have fresh fruit and veg in their diet. And we're delivering really high quality things like we get donations from New Common Garden Market and Whole Foods. And that is the largest um, component of our deliveries. A very um, little pocket of quick fire questions, Laura, where you just have sure. to do one word answers. Optimist or pessimist? Uh, somewhere in between. <laughs> Perfectionist? <laughs> Perfectionist, yes. Introvert, extrovert or an ambivert? Well, I'm more of an introvert, but this job has forced me to try and be an extrovert at times. How are you finding that? Well, I think some people get energized by being an extrovert. I do find it it is depleting. So I have to balance my days in a way that I can have some introvert time. I know that feeling. Uh, morning or afternoon person? Afternoon, definitely. Afternoon. Okay. So on that note, we're heading into the exciting part of the show, which is the chocolate section. And Laura has got some amazing chocolate to share. And I couldn't get the same, but I have got the same brand. So Laura, what have you got in your little goodie bag. Oh, well, I have Amadei Tuscan chocolate. And um, this was something that um, was donated to City Harvest. Um, just That's a very good donation. And yeah, so I just I, I, I mention it be to, to just show the quality of the food that's donated. So obviously, um, it, this would have come from some restaurant or hospitality company that had to shutter its doors during the COVID crisis gave us basically a pallet of this chocolate. So you're going to tuck in. Is it a milk chocolate? Yes, it is. I think it's a 32%. When you take a morsel of it, mm -hmm. it should have notes of cream, milk, butter and white flowers. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Yes. There you go. And mine has uh, is 70% single origin from Venezuela, still Amadei. Um, and it is absolutely delicious. And the tasting notes that go alongside it say that it has notes of coffee and incense mm -hmm. and that it is spicy. I think this is just one of the best treats I've had in a while. I'm, I'm just oh, loving this chocolate. Keep tucking in. <laughs> I mean, Amadei is one of the best chocolates that you can get. It's phenomenal. How sure. do you perceive success and failure, those two words? Well, 
I think success is just moving something forward. So I know there, there's often lots of roadblocks and stumbling, stumbling blocks, and but I guess one can't consider those as failure. But as long as you're moving forward, making something happen, I think that's mm -hmm. success. And failure? I guess failure is when you don't give up when you should or give up when you shouldn't. Does that make sense? <laughs> I don't know if that, that certainly makes does. sense. It certainly does. On the show, we look at the founder's well-being because I think it's a really important aspect that sometimes can get neglected. I certainly neglected it at times when I was um, running my chocolate business. How and where, Laura, does stress affect you? Well, every day there is stress because, um, you know, as I mentioned, there is so much mm -hmm. going on. You know, stress where it gets to the point where you're not productive. Stress actually motivates me in some sense. I need some mm -hmm. elements of stress to keep me going. When it, when it gets to the point where it's a barrier, that's an issue. But where does it affect you? Do you become irritable? Do you sort of shut down? Yeah. How does it manifest? I'd say I become impatient. I lose patience quickly. Yeah, the key word, isn't it? How important is well-being for you? I mean, do you manage to make the time to bring it into your life on a daily basis? I should do more. And it's been really challenging these last few months during this crisis to have mm -hmm. that kind of balance. But I do find some time for Pilates on a regular basis. That is my downtime and my de-stressing outlet. Pilates is amazing. I got into it in lockdown. I, um, It's a course by this girl, Chloe, online Pilates. Highly recommend it. But the posture and the sort of way that you feel is just incredible, isn't it? Absolutely. I've been doing it for many, many years, almost a couple of decades. It's been an important part of my life. It's also hard work. I remember thinking, oh, I'm sure Pilates isn't hard work. And it's when you sort of do the core exercises, you're thinking, flipping heck, it's worse than the gym. Absolutely. Do you have a daily ritual at all with your well-being? Is there something that you do every day? If it's possible, I try to fit Pilates into my schedule each mm -hmm. day. That's not always the case. It certainly hasn't been lately. I'd like to do more things surrounding well-being. Um, I'd like to say I had time to meditate and all that, but um, unfortunately that has not been part of my day. How do you survive the onslaught with this digital world that we now have with constant notifications on phones and, and that sort of thing? It's a problem because, um, you know, I'm constantly checking texts, WhatsApp, email. So I'm as guilty as the next person of just being overwhelmed by um, technology. I'm looking for a solution. So if you know of one, please tell me, but I don't have the answer. Well, I tell you what I did, which I don't know if is right or wrong. I switched off the notifications of emails because that was really stressing me out because I felt I had to act on every notification that came up. And now I don't. So I look at my emails when I'm in email mode and then I won't look at them. I think people realize that they can ring if, if it's urgent. People should ring. Yep. or WhatsApp. And I also um, switch my phone off at night quite early <laughs> because I just think I can't be bothered. Uh, do you switch your phone off at all at night, Laura? Yeah, I, I do switch it off, but I tend to read late at night and I'm doing it on my iPad, which is probably not the best thing to be doing. So I, well, I should switch good. everything off. But it's still um, the ambient light from an iPad is, is not the best thing to be exposed to. So I, I know I'm doing that in error. A guest on the show actually earlier on, Niraj, he wears special glasses after I think seven or eight at night. The yellow tinted glasses? Yeah, or yellow tinted. or blue or, yeah. or pink or something, yeah. but there's yeah. some form of tinted glasses that we should yeah. all be getting. Do you have time for your family and friends, Laura, as you're full on with City Harvest? Yeah, I do. Um, because late at night, I could speak to my friends in New York and other mm -hmm. places. So I use the time zones to great benefit. So at different times of day, I can speak to different people. Technology helps them, you know, FaceTime. I mean, you might sleep like a log. I have no idea. But if you can't sleep, what do you do? Do you get up in the night or? Um... No, I, I read. I do get a lot of books in in the course of the week. Um, I don't sleep that much and I mm -hmm. like to read a lot. How much sleep do you feel that you need? Well, I'm not a good example, but I probably um, don't need more than six hours a night. That's not bad. I think they recommend eight or something, isn't it? Seven or eight. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think six is too healthy. Do you have any hobbies that you enjoy doing? As I said, Pilates and reading and running when I have a bit more time. 
Do you have a book that you could recommend to the listeners? I really like World War II related nonfiction, and I do read a lot of memoirs. So that's um, the genre I'm mainly focused on. Which one would you recommend if someone wants to have a dip into that area? Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson about Winston Churchill and London during the Blitz, which I really like. I do have a book group, so that keeps you uh, on your toes. It keeps me on my toes. We're reading Lady in Waiting about. Um, oh, Lady Glen Connor. Isn't that the most amazing book? I really, yeah, yeah. really enjoyed it. Basically, yesterday I read that whole book because my book group is this week and I always read things last minute. Wow, you must be a speedy reader. Laura, where have you had to have loads of hope? and also a dollop of patience. And it can be in a work environment or personal world. Yeah, that's a tough question. I have to say that during the crisis in the last three months, we weren't sure whether City Harvest would stay open. Things started to happen so quickly in London. So it involved great hope that we could stay open and keep serving our partners, but that was based on whether we could keep our team safe, do everything possible to keep running in a professional, safe way. So that involved great hope and we were fortunate. The team was heroic, kept going. Patience every day. You know, there are lots of demands on us. You know, food donors want us to collect food quickly. Charity partners need food delivered at a certain time and things are fast moving and there's great demand. So it requires great patience to stay composed and make things happen. It would be impossible to keep City Harvest running day to day without great patience. Do you have any advice to anyone who's thinking of setting up a social enterprise or charity? Yeah, well, if it is specifically a food rescue charity, I'm, we are always happy to share with people what we know. Uh, we have p had people come visit us from other countries, other cities, students from universities that want to do that. We have a few in tomorrow from Durham University and we love to share what we know. So one thing I could say is we like to pay it forward. And so if for those people that are starting charities, you know, I just advise to do the same. So when we started and we were tiny, we reached out to other charities for advice. There were so many so generous with their time. That's made a huge difference to us, um, like Second Harvest in Toronto. We literally ask them questions all the time. They're 30 years ahead of us and they are always patient with our questions and respond immediately. And so we at City Harvest hope that we could be the same to you know any other charity that's starting up. That is fantastic. So any of you lovely listeners who need some advice, head to City Harvest. So Laura, how can we find more out about City Harvest? And how can our listeners get more involved? Is it the funding side? Is it the volunteer side? People can go to our website, cityharvest.org.uk, to sign up to volunteer. Um, at the moment, it's a little hard to get a slot because people are so eager to help those less fortunate in these times that a lot of our volunteer slots are taken. But that they will open up soon. So just you know, keep going back to our site to try and and volunteer and fundraising, any type of you know just giving campaign to help us is enormously. Um, helpful. So for every pound donated, we can deliver four meals. For That's really incredible. Highly, yeah, we, we operate really uh, in a very lean way. We use donations very efficiently and effectively. So any contribution, no matter how small, makes a difference. 10 pounds, 40 meals, you can donate on the website. The other thing is awareness raising. We've been very focused on operations. We don't have a big PR or marketing budget. And so awareness isn't as high as it should be about what we do, given that this year we'll redistribute around 5 million meals. Uh, awareness is not commensurate with that. So anyone that's listening that gets to know City Harvest and can share things about us on social media, that's super helpful because that leads to more food donations, which we need, and more funding. So we need more food businesses to understand that any unused surplus food should go to people rather than waste. So aren't we lucky to have had Laura on the show today? I mean, I've certainly learned a load and I hope you guys have too. So thank you, Laura, so much for joining us. And I know you're a busy, busy lady and to fit this in is a massive donation of your time to us all. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you for having me. Thanks so much.
So the book recommendation for this episode is The Book of Forgiving by Archbishop Desmond Tutu and his daughter, the Reverend Fo Tutu. It's just an incredible read. I found that when I ran my chocolate business, there was a bit of forgiving that I was really struggling with. And it was making me quite angry, the whole situation. And reading this book, there were snippets in it that really helped me forgive the situation and have real peace with it. So I would recommend it highly to have on your bookshelf. And the quote is from Albert Einstein. Try not to become a man of success, rather become a man of value. Huge thank you to my lovely listeners for finding the show. Don't forget to subscribe to get the latest episode. And if you're enjoying the show, it would be truly fab if you could rate and review it. As a well-known supermarket says, every little helps. Any book recommendations, quotes, songs can be found in the show notes and on the website. So until the next time, however tough the times get, keep that inner sparkle you have. Hope and Patience with Amelia Rope. Join the conversation at hopeandpatience.co.uk. Find Amelia on Facebook and Instagram at Hope and Patience or on Twitter at Amelia Rope.